here this afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we have something to pray for. We just found out our, our Maryland rag has been having some severe blood pressure issues. Looks like it's balanced, but uh, we love everybody in the church. But there's uh, people like Maryland, it's just really easy to pray for. So we're going to pray for her today. We also want to remember that our own uh, Donna Palmer uh, is going to be baptized this Saturday at 430. Uh, with, my son. with her son Zane coming in from Dallas. If you're available uh, at 4:30, we're going to start gathering. Then we may baptize at 4:45, or but we're going to sing a little and pray together, and then uh, lead her and her son into the baptistry. If you're available and want to celebrate new life in Christ, come join us. And uh, I think that's all. A reminder: we've got uh, uh, Good Friday service this Friday at 6 p.m. The vigil is all day, uh, Friday noon to Saturday noon. You're invited to come and take advantage of that as many times as you want, as long as you want. The board is almost completely covered. The elders have done a stellar job at making it to go. And so now you can, as the church members, can take full advantage of that, bring friends, um, and uh, join in a way that the disciples were unable to do, and that is to stay up and watch. They couldn't. But now we have the Holy Spirit, and the church is now able to stay up and watch and sit with Jesus as the resurrected Lord and to pray for other people. So hope you take advantage of that privilege and that ability God has given you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your uh, willingness to offer a plan of salvation, that your righteousness and justice would always be met. So that we never have to pick, you never have to pick between being merciful and being just. For even in your mercy, there is justice through the cross. Lord God, we pray a blessing over this room. We pray that you would pour out your spirit to our intellects that so desperately need your spirit to guide us. Our hearts that still struggle with sin and doubt. Our physical bodies, which ache and get hot and cold. Today we pray for Marilyn. We pray you would bless her and bring her blood pressure into balance. Pray for all of our members that are struggling physically. Lord, we pray a blessing over Donna. We thank you for her willingness and eagerness to walk in the Holy Spirit and to obey you in baptism. We thank you for her son Zane, who likewise has heard the call. Bless us now, Lord, as we turn to your word and learn and grow for faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes through the word of Christ. Grow our faith, we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. Okay. We are just covering a few verses today. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Chip 7. This is 6. Yeah, just ignore that. Go ahead and edit that. This is infallible. <laughs> this, not so much. So if you can take your pen and mark out Hebrews 6, put Hebrews 7, chapters 1, or verses 1 through 10, because we covered those verses last week. No, it's not. Just the, just the scripture. Just, look at the date. All I did was forget to change the scripture. So I'm asking you, can you take your pen, mark out chapter 6, and write? Yeah, that's all. That's all. Yeah. You can technically write whatever you want, but that's what I would do. Um, but thanks for drawing the call attention to that. So we are covering, again, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. May God's blessing be added to the reading, the hearing, and understanding of his holy word. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, 
means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch, Abraham, gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people, that is, brothers, even though their brothers are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without a doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So we are in the, again, in the, the part of Hebrews, the epistle to the Jewish Christian that's designed to beg the Jewish Christian to maintain faith in Jesus, going back to the law of Moses, going back to the safety of the synagogue that's not Christian, even though it seems like it might protect your children and your businesses and you're just going to do it for a short time before the persecution cools down, to go back is deadly. To go back to leave the gospel for any reason is never the right option. Better to be martyred. He's going to get to that. The writer will get to that. Some of you have suffered, but not to the point of bleeding. The church has always been persecuted. So this letter is written to specific, so it may not be the same thing that you're facing, but we can understand the pressure of leaving the gospel or minimizing the gospel. But for the Jewish Christian, the persecution was so severe and the temptation to go back to Judaism, the Jews were not being persecuted by the Romans, just the Christian Jews, just the Christians. And this ploy of Satan to call these people who had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and seen it as the fulfillment of the law of Moses, this ploy of Satan to use pain to get them to, to recant. Jesus, Jesus who? Who does that sound like? Sounds like Peter. Never heard of him. I'm a good Jew. That, that passion, that, pa that power, that uh, temptation was very real back then. That is the whole reason the book of Hebrews was given. Now we can learn from it as, as Gentile Christians. This part of the story, this part of the epistle is about the priesthood of Jesus. We've already covered he's the better messenger than angels. He's the better apostle than Moses. And now we know he's the better priest than all of the collected priests. Every one of the priests put into one giant priest monster, the priest, the priest strength of the Levites, Jesus, the singular priest, outranks them all. Now to a Jew, the priesthood of Aaron, the priesthood of the Levites would have been embedded into their conscience. This is religion. What is religion without a priest? And so there's a lot of spade work that has to be done in the church back then to help them see that the priest they have in Jesus Christ is the right one. I've written here that on the top bullet, so Jesus is superior as a priest, and that is designed to bring us comfort and assurance. Priests represent a, a people to our God. They do not rep represent all people. They represent a people. And so if you're not a Christian, if you've not given your life to Christ, you are not represented by Jesus. But if you are a Christian, then you certainly have the same priest that stands before the Father for all the Christians who've ever come before you. And the priest has to be selected by God. They can't sign up for this themselves. God has to appoint them. And they must be selected from those they represent. This is why it was so important for Jesus to become man. If Jesus had not become man, then what? Then what? He couldn't represent us. Isn't that amazing to think. 
The whole reason he became a man and lived a human life was so that in this day he could stand up as a man and represent men and women. <laughs> the work he did to become your priest. And he asked us to trust him to be your priest. Now, as we shift gears and look at your anchor behind the veil, the reason you're saved and continue to be saved, the integrity of the gospel, the integrity of the covenant you have with God is Jesus Christ. As long as the Father is pleased with the Son, the church is in good shape. If at any point the Father and the Son start warring against each other, then all bets are off. What I just said sounds insane, doesn't it? It's amazing to think the two most loving and lovable people, persons, through the power of the Spirit, the Father and the Son, whose love knows no end, the integrity of your covenant with God is bound up in their relationship. It's amazing. He's our priest. Now, every priesthood has an order. Uh, the two orders of the legitimate priesthood in the Bible are the Levitical priest and the Melchizedek priest. And those of you who um, have not yet uh, enjoyed the Old Testament or considered reading through Leviticus, uh, this is my, um, my charge to you, my encouragement to you. Maybe this is the year that you examine and see uh, how beautiful the Old Testament is, not just in the stories of Genesis, but in the, the whole law of God. This is designed, the Old Testament's designed to show us the need for a greater priest than all of the Levitical priests. So the order of a priesthood defines its role, its scope, and its longevity. And the readers of Hebrews, the original readers, were likely and wrongly superimposing the Levitical order to Jesus' priesthood. They couldn't shake it. That when they think of priests, they think of the Levitical priest. If I use the word priest today, what do you think? Catholic, Catholic priest, right? Was Jesus a Catholic priest? No. no. Uh, and so we have to define terms. And that's what this, this small and yet powerful section is designed to do, to get you all the way back to Melchizedek. And I want you to look at verse 4. What does your version say? Just saying. Just think how great he was. So that's my goal today is for you to think how great this priest is and this order is before we get to next week about the ins and outs of the details of it. Uh, Genesis 14 is where the story comes from. So just a little uh, rhetorical questions. Uh, which book came first, Genesis or Leviticus? Genesis. Genesis. Uh, the life of Abraham or the life of Moses? Abraham came first. Uh, the promise to Abraham of the covenant that he would be a father and have uh, a descendant who would bless every nation, would that come first or did the Ten Commandments? The promise came before the Ten Commandments. So that's what we're designed to do. The writer's trying to get us back to origin. The book of Genesis is origin. When you and I read the book of Genesis, we have a sacred text that God is giving you to say, you, this is how you as a Christian ought to see uh, what predates everything else. Who made the heavens and the earth? Did randomness? No, God did. Uh, who, 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 who made marriage? God made it through Adam and Eve. Who decided that the human race would be complemented with two genders? God did. Uh, who, who decided that if you're going to approach God, you must come with blood sacrifice? He did. He did. With, remember Abel versus Cain? One came with fruits and veggies and the other came with blood, right? Who, who decided? So you go back to Genesis and you, you predate all of this human history and all of the wars and all of the nations that have risen up against other nations and all the languages and all the religions. And you go back to Genesis. Genesis is a gift to you to go back to the origin of things, to believe it. Well, the story of Melchizedek, what book of the Bible is it in? It's in Genesis. And it's fairly early in Genesis. So let's turn to Genesis 14. Because the Jews, when you use the word priest, they didn't think Catholic priest. There was no such thing. 
Jews back then, when you said priests, they thought of Leviticus. They thought of Numbers and Exodus. But the priesthood we believe in is revealed first in Genesis 14. If you're familiar with this story, Genesis uh, 12 is when God calls Abraham and makes a promise to him. Last week we discussed this. He called Abraham, made a promise. He uh, covenanted with Abraham. He ratified it through blood. God uh, gave a sign of the covenant, circumcision. And then finally, after Mount Moriah in chapter 22, God gave an oath. He vowed, he said, I solemnly swear by myself that I will do what I promise to do. Four steps, not because God uh, needs to prove that he's trustworthy, but because we don't have enough faith. The covenanted, the saints need help to believe uh, how firm a foundation that we stand on. In the midst of this story, Abraham has a nephew named Lot. That's another story for another time, but Lot ends up living amongst uh, the pagans. In chapter one, uh, chapter 14, verse 1, you see a summary of all of these wars between uh, Gentile kings. They're going back and forth. I'll just read it quickly. At this time, this king from Shinar, Erak king of Elisar, this K king from Elam, and Tidal king of Goim went to war against Bera king of Sodom, Bersha, Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Adma. And so they go through all these kings and they battle. Looks like four against five or something like that. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Siddim. For 12 years they had been subject to the K king. But in the 13th year, they rebelled. So that's the why they're having the war. In the 14th year, the K king and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Rephaites and the, these other people um, in the hill country. So all this is going on. They conquered. There you go. Verse 8. Then the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. Sound familiar? Where was Lot living? Sodom and Gomorrah. The king of Adma, the king of Zo Zeboim, the king of Bela marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Siddim against the K king of Elam, Tidal king of Goim, and all these kings. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, whom the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. When they fled, some of their men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all their goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their food, and they went away. Now here's where we are concerned. There's wars and battles all the time, but here's where we're concerned. They also carried off Abram's nephew, Lot, and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. Reminds me of uh, Shenandoah, the movie. The battle is getting closer and closer to the farm. The dad says, the sons are like, when are we going to take up arms? When are we getting involved? He says, is it on our land yet? It doesn't concern us. And eventually, what happened? Encroached, 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 and then they, they ended up stealing, uh, capturing the youngest son of the father. It concerns us now. You see? Did these battles concern Abraham before? But now it concerns us. Did we go pick and fights? No. Lot belonged to Abram. Uh, 13, one who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now, Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 men in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, all of this battle so far was power people trying to preserve their power, get taxes, be winners, not losers. What you're going to see next is the reason Abram has victory is because his pursuit was a righteous pursuit. He only had how many men? <laughs> enough, to, enough to get down to the singular man. Not about 300 men, it's 318, he knew them by name. During the night, Abram divided his men, attacked them, and routed them. 
Again, these are kings who had beat real armies over and over again. 318 men, Abraham was able to do this. He pursued them as far as Goba, north of Damascus. He recovered all of the goods, and he brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and other people. So Genesis 14 is about, number one, a mighty man named Abraham. Now, he wasn't mighty in his own right. He had been called by name, given a heart after God, just like David, who slew Goliath. This is a very similar story. Slew or slayed, I don't know. But he, he was not involved, but all of a sudden, it was what he was supposed to do. So God was with him, and he pursued. This is also, uh, in a sense, an example of... Uh, a member of the church of Jesus Christ, somebody written in the, the book of life, uh, how the true victor, Jesus, will not stop until he has all of his sheep. Not 99, all of his sheep. So Abraham was victorious. Now here's where we get to Melchizedek. After Abram, Ab Abram returned from defeating K king and all the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley. Then Melchizedek, first time we hear of this guy, Melchizedek. Now, real quick, Melchi Hebrews describes Melchizedek as a man who has no father or mother, no genealogy, no beginning, no end. So here you have this person just appear. So if you're watching a movie, all of a sudden walks in this guy. What does he look like? Uh, did, did, was he old? Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. <laughs> I mean, just, just think of the... because the. The whole point of this, this part of Hebrews is how great he was. So you look at all of the characters in the story. You have Abraham, who is so far has been the mightiest man in the scene. But how does he compare to Melchizedek? So Melchizedek walks into the camera view, and he's just he, all of the attention goes to him, not to Abraham. Who's the other king there? So, yeah, you have the king of Sodom who has a much, much more possessions, uh, a much more, uh, wouldn't call it ethical or moral, but a greater civilization than Abraham's living in tents. The king of Sodom has buildings and walls. And so you have this king, you have Abraham, and then you have Melchizedek. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, he brings out what? Bread and wine. What does that remind you of? He brings up bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. We've never seen anybody like this so far in the Bible. God's own priest is just living on the planet, walking around. Nobody apparently has seen him before. And he just walks from behind a rock. Here I am. <laughs> and he does what? He blesses Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High. Creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Who won the battle? God. It was God. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. <laughs> well, yes. Is there a correlation between verse 18 where you the bread and wine the last summer? It's a stretch. But it's there. And we'll, we'll review that in just a second. Now, this is what's funny. is That's the, that's the most... If, so if you're reading all of Genesis 14, Hebrews says the most important thing wasn't the battle. It's not all the other kings. It's this man. And so it's funny that you have this timeless scene with Abraham and Melchizedek, and then it's like time stops. And then time starts back up, and here the king of Sodom speaks up. This... Guy, I don't, I don't even know his name, don't care. The king of Sodom. Now, we know what happens to his kingdom, right? Right? Yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay. So, the righteous king has just spoken. Now the king of Sodom speaks. He's the king of unrighteousness. He said to Abraham, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand to the Lord. All caps, what does that mean? That's Yahweh. When Lord is all caps in your Bible, that's, Yahweh. that's the name Yahweh. For some reason, the editors were afraid to put Yahweh to not, bless, to not use his name in vain. So when you see Lord, that's Yahweh. 
I have raised my hand to Yahweh, God Most High. Is it interesting? Has God told Abraham his name yet? When do we know, when do we know the Lord's name? Not until Moses. Remember the burning bush? 500 years later? Who, who should I say is sending me so that the Hebrews, the descendants of Abraham, would believe I'm coming in your name? He said, tell them the Lord sent you, Yahweh. Isn't it interesting? How was Abraham able to know to say this? Because the blessing he received from God through the priest Melchizedek has given him temporary divine is an actual blessing. He has the ministry of the Holy Spirit at work in him right now. Uh, I have written in my Bible here, he gave him a tithe before the law ever came. Exactly. And we're going to cover that today, too. Oh, okay. So, anyhow, he, he uses the name that he hasn't been told yet, somehow. Here's a mystery. Creator of heaven and earth, and he says to the king of Solomon, I have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, king of Sodom, not even a thread of, or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have already eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Aner, Eshcol, and Memre. Let them have their share. So Abram's referring to these Gentile men who are just allies with him. His own clan is not going to receive anything. So that's the story. That's where we need to go back to Genesis to read to understand um, Hebrews 7. So I'm just going to review what we've read based on our notes. So mighty Abraham kneels to a higher authority. This is, in a sense, God in human form, his, his representative, his priest. This is the singular priest, Melchizedek. We also know he's a priest king. In the Old Testament, you had three offices that are seen in the three gifts of the wise men. What do the wise men bring Jesus? Gold, Frankenstein, and myrrh. <laughs> As a kid, you know. <laughs> Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In each of those, that's Matthew's, it's only in Matthew, talk, it talk, that's to highlight even the Gentiles recognized Jesus fulfills all three offices of the Old Testament leadership. There was a, uh, what are the three branches of government, the federal government? The executive branch, the ju ju judicial, don't ever say that if you've been drinking or they'll think you're drunk, judicial and legislative branch. So those are the three, so you had three branches of government in the Old Testament too, you had the gold, which represents the king. You had the frankincense, which represents the priest. And then you had the myrrh, which represents the prophet. Myrrh is uh, the number one spice used for embalming or preparing, not embalming, but preparing a dead body. The prophets were, always asso were, were associated with myrrh because they would all be killed. By who? By God? By the Gentiles? By their own people. Jesus was given those three gifts as a baby, as a two-year-old or so, to, sh to show that these are the three offices he would fulfill. In the Old Testament, you, didn't, you never had one person fulfilling two or three offices. That would be a, a conflict of interest, or you'd lose your checks and balances. And so one of my favorite times in the history of uh, Israel, to see all three branches of the government was when you had King David, you know King David, the sinful king with a heart after God. You had the priest. Do you know the name of the priest? Nathan. He's the prophet. Oh, he's the prophet. Nathan's the prophet. Zadok. So, King David, priest Zadok, I like that name, and the Nathan, Nathan was the prophet. When, when David sinned against the Lord by sleeping with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband Uriah, 
Who did God send to David to call him to repentance? Who was it? Nathan. What's Nathan's role? He's the prophet. So, remember this. The prophet and the priest have photonegative roles. The priest presents the people to who? The prophet represents God to the people. So when Nathan came to David, he was speaking on behalf of God to David. And he said, he gave him a parable. A man had a goat, his favorite goat, his only goat. It was, a, it was his golden retriever. It was his pet. <laughs> this other man, his neighbor, was a rich man. He had hundreds of thousands of, of animals to slaughter. The rich man had a friend come by, and instead of slaughtering his own animal, he steals his poor man's neighbor's goat and kills him. Gives him up. And what did David say? What should happen to the rich man? He, should, he deserves to die. That's what David said. And what did, Dave, what did Nathan say to David? You're the man. Yeah. The, now we say that in a good way. You're the man. But you're the man. All right? So I don't know how we got this far down the road. But, <laughs> but I think the point is here, Melchizedek is different. It's a rarity. Melchizedek is both a priest and a king. Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king. Melchizedek, this, this mysterious person, is two things at once, a priest and a king. That's why he receives a king's share, which is the tithe. Um, his king, so we'll just talk about his kingdom. His kingdom is uh, righteousness. That's what his name means, the king of righteousness. You know, you think of all the clans back then. I'm, I'm Lothar of the hill people. I am, you know, they had all the, you know, we live by the coast and we, we are the, I'm the king of this area and we have fish for our industry. And this other person says, well, I'm, I'm of Lebanon and we have the cedars of Lebanon, these great trees that you need to build your stuff. And that's, that's, that's our economy. That's what we offer. Everybody had strength. Everybody had their thing. It's just like uh, universities, you know, what's your, who's your mascot? What are you known for? What's your state? So all of these kings had the thing they would put up front. But Melchizedek, his reign was righteousness. He ruled with righteousness. That's what he's known for. That's what he works in. That's his craft. So why does he come to bless Abraham? Because what Abraham has just done was of righteousness. It was God who did it. This king doesn't go up to the king of Sodom and bless him, does he? Yeah. So you have this priest going around the world, watching, he's being sent by the Father, by Yahweh. And as Yahweh's kingdom is beginning, beginning to come forth, he's right there to, to walk next to the thread of God's redemptive history and to bless it. And, and, and we don't know where else he'll show up in Scripture, but this is the only record, record we have of him physically somewhere. He's the king of righteousness. Salem is the other part of his name, uh, which is short for Jerusalem, and it also means the king of peace. Now, he brings bread and wine, and I think it's, it's tempting to stretch this into communion, into the communion service. Um, originally, it would, have, it would have been the gifts of uh, a, a rich man to a, to a warrior to refresh them after battle. So it's not necessarily the body and blood of Jesus or the, the Passover meal, uh, although you could make that connection if you wanted to. To Abraham at the time, that would have been uh, gifts from heaven to him to refresh him after doing the right thing. Now, after feeding him, he does two things. Number one is he blesses Abram, and, he gives, and then Abram gives a tenth, to Melchizedek. So here, y'all know any lawyers, by the way? <laughs> L law lawyers can make words say anything. Have you noticed that? So what happens in this blessing is Melchizedek is, is using words that are, that are the right words 
the most pure words to bless Abram and bring glory to God, God our Father. Abraham responds by bringing clarification as the blessed man. The, the study Bible I have mentions that the pagans, the, uh, the Baal worshipers, all of the other foreign gods back then could have taken the words of Melchizedek and tried to apply it to their gods. They believed, for instance, the Baal worshipers believed that their god was the one who brings um, you know, rain and sunshine. Uh, others believed uh, Molech, the god you would sacrifice your children to. You would take your oldest child and put it in the hands of this idol and it would be burned alive. Uh, that, that that god was the one. And so what's interesting is when Melchizedek blesses, he's speaking pure words from heaven. Blessed be Abraham by who? Elohim, God most high. Creator of heaven and earth. Now we know who created the heavens and earth. Any old God? A council of gods? Who was it? <laughs> Yahweh. The God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a specific person. He's not a man, he's, a, he's God, but he's, he's got a personality. So when, when, he, when Melchizedek's saying this, he doesn't have to preface that because he knows who he's talking about. He said, blessed be the God most high who delivered your enemies into your hands. Now notice in verse 22, Abraham takes it even further. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, Sodom, I have raised my hand to Yahweh, the God who speaks to me, not the God of my imagination, not the God of the surrounding nations, the God who has called me by name. He is God most high, creator of heaven and earth. I've taken an oath in his name. So Melchizedek blesses the lesser man, Abram. Abraham receives it by faith. What are we supposed to do when somebody compliments us? Are you good at receiving compliments? No. I'm not good at it. So what are we supposed to do? We're, we're just supposed to think, thank you. Right? Receive it, right? Yeah. Receive It's a gift. Yeah. We're tempted to say, oh, you know, it's no big deal. or oh, you, You're not receiving it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or you might be receiving it, but you don't have the etiquette. We've not learned. So, I mean, I'm going somewhere with this, by the way. But <laughs> when somebody is complimenting you, uh, l consider today what it means to receive a compliment. In church, at the end of our service, we offer the, the specific blessing that God told Aaron to use over Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. How do we receive that? So we, we know it's a gift, so we need to receive it. What does that mean? How do, what do you do when you're receiving the blessing? The blessing? Be grateful. <laughs> what should we do? Receive the love. Do we have our eyes open or closed? Do we, do we, what do we, I, these are the kind of questions I had when I was a kid. I remember sitting in service in the pastoral prayer, this, this five, ten minute prayer going on. I was like, what am I supposed to do here? Do I pray my own prayer in competition with that guy? Do I repeat what he's saying? Am I just sitting here as an audience between God and this pastor? What do I do? So, well, in, in, the, in the pastoral prayer, we're not receiving anything. We're, we're praying with, we're praying as a community. But how do you receive a blessing? Now, I'm not going to have the answers for us all today, but I want you to be thinking about that between now and Easter. I, I, I can guarantee, at least in this church, that there's going to be a moment when someone's going to, someone's going to repeat the words of God from Aaron into the church on the basis of a better priest, Jesus, that you've blessed God by your attendance here today, by your honoring him today with your heart and your mind, and now he's turning to you and he's going to bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord's face to shine upon you. And just be thinking between now and Sunday, how are you going to receive that blessing? Abraham, Abram received the blessing because we know he walks in that blessing when he's speaking to the king of Sodom. He speaks as a blessed man. I remember uh, 
a man named Rex Faulkner in my home church. We were in, uh, this is probably 1988, 1990, and my dad's got all of his kids. My mom's there, and we're learning to walk in Jesus. And Rex Faulkner comes up to my dad and looks at him and says, you are one God-blessed man. <laughs> I just remember hearing that. How do you receive the blessing? Next, Abraham, Abram, then gives a tithe, the tenth, to the king of uh, Salem, Melchizedek. So this is Abram kneeling. Hebrews says, absolutely, the greater blesses the lesser. So Abram's kneeling to receive this blessing, and then Abram returns and gives him a, a tenth. This is the king's portion. Now, just while we're on the topic of, of the tenth, I want to cover this quickly. This happened well before the law of Moses. And this would have been a standard contribution that a man like Abraham would give to a king, whoever he was submitting himself to. And unless you yourself sat on a throne, you were under somebody. Did you notice that Abraham wouldn't receive anything from Sodom or give anything to Sodom? <coughs> Who's his king? Christ is king. Who's your king? Christ is king. So, traditionally back then, you would, you would give a tenth. Now, this is before the law of Moses. It's different than Christian giving. Uh, it's, well, it's fulfilled in Christ now. But while we're on the topic, I just want to bring up the concept of tithes. In the, New, in the Old Testament, it's not a tithe, it's tithes. Uh, and now, don't, don't freak out. Let me cover this real quick. The first one is the one you're probably most familiar with. Uh, this is a tithe or a, a, uh, a payment that was required for all of Israel to give to the Levites. And from that tenth, they gave a tenth. What's a tenth of a tenth? That 1%? So 1% would make it to, to the priests. But where did the Levites live? They, were dis they, were all, they didn't own their own land. They lived amongst the people like uh, the yeast and the dough. So when you gave your tithe, your, your tenth, you would give it to the Levites, and they would make sure that 10% of that would make it to the priesthood. And the priesthood eventually ended up where? In Jerusalem. They ended up in a singular location. <clears throat> That's tithe number one. <laughs> tithe number two was a sacred meal before the Lord. We're not going to review that today, but Deuteronomy 14 says, every year after you collect your crop, you are to take your top 10% and cook the biggest meal you can think of, invite your friends, and go to Jerusalem and eat it. <laughs> we don't normally think of that as the tithe, do we? Your, your job is to eat it. Now, if, if you're, Deuteronomy 14 says, now, if, if you've had such a good year with your crop that you can't carry it, your 10%, to Jerusalem, you can sell, if you live in, say, Galilee, you can sell your crop there, exchange it for money, travel to Jerusalem, and there purchase whatever it is you like. Whatever you want. Wine, not pigs, chicken. You, I mean, you can buy whatever you want and eat a meal before the Lord. We don't normally hear that part, do we? It's like the biblical model of Thanksgiving. God, in the Old Testament, wanted his people to to regularly pause and have a big meal in the presence of God with your loved ones. And he says, invite the Levites. Because the Levites don't have, any, they don't have any property. That's why you have your pastor over for lunch after, after church, you know, <laughs> for fried chicken. All right, number three is this, the third tithe is every three years you were to tithe to the poor. So what's, what's that percentage-wise? 3%, 0.333, right? 3.3333% over three years makes 10%. So you were to constantly be setting aside money for the poor. So what's, I mean, it's almost like a tax, isn't it? 23.3% every year. What's your tax rate? <laughs> I'm sorry to ask. It's that time of year. I don't know if you filed your taxes yet. 
But in the Old Testament, this is how it worked. This is how you functioned. And the people were not living, uh, they were not supposed to live under the thumb of Egypt and Assyria and Babylon. This is how this community would function. This is how you make your contribution to the greater good. Tax, tithing and taxes are pretty close in the Old Testament. And so when people hate paying taxes, I mean, can you imagine, like, we live in the, we live in the walled community of the world. I'll, I'll pay my taxes. You know where we live? You know how safe it is here relative? I mean, the, the, the opportunities we have when people grumble about paying their tax. I mean, I, I don't want to pay too much tax. But think about it. What other place would you want to live? Well, in God's kingdom, in the Old Testament, to be part of Israel, if you moaned and groaned at this, it meant you forgot Egypt. You forgot that you were once not a people, and now you are a people. And this is your way to not be rotted and ruined by hoarding everything God gives you, but sharing to the Levites and sharing to the poor. This was a commandment. So when we're talking about tithe, in the Old Testament, we're actually talking about tithes. There are three tithes. I've noticed it's not taught very clearly in the church. And uh, it's also conflated with Christian giving today. Now, I hope the Finance Committee doesn't blow a gasket here, but tithing is not a New Testament concept. Did you know that? In fact, every Sunday, I'm just sometimes operating on autopilot, uh, our deacons are invited to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. I should probably just say offerings or our giving. Um, now, there's a debate on the 10%. And uh, generally, people who like to debate the 10% are debating it because they want to pay less, not more, than 10%. <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs> Just putting that out there. Um, and so, when we're, there are really 10, I don't want to get into giving too much today, but there are 10 principles in the New Testament on giving. The core of it all is that Jesus and the apostles highlight that our giving, our offering, is a core dynamic of the Christian life. That to be a generous person with the things God gives you is, a, is an essential uh, to the Christian life. Valerie and I have chosen the tithe as our model, as our base. That's what we're going to do automatically to our local church. Our tithe comes here. Now, we don't tithe the Old Testament style. We just like to have a number to work with, and then we'll fluctuate um, based on that. Based on how the Lord blesses us here. I like Bob Lawless says, what if we reversed it and said, instead of giving 10%, what if what you give now determines next year? <laughs> Is that good news or bad news? But anyhow, so that's, giving is a core dynamic to the Christian life. But here's the point, with our Lord as the model and motivation. 2 Corinthians 8 says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. He's always the model. He teaches giving. His apostles teach giving, generosity. But it's not in the same model as the Old Testament. Um, so I just want to bring, anytime we're talking about Melchizedek, people bring up the 10%. The, you know, some are like, that's the model. That's what we're supposed to do. That is, not a, that is not fulfilled in the New Testament. That is not um, taught in the New Testament. Instead, giving, uh, we don't ask, we don't do the ask a lot here, and God has given us an abundance. And a church that's full of the Spirit, that fears God and realizes that that's part of my life, uh, He allows, for instance, our church right now is, 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 we're going through the steps, it's not fulfilled yet, but we're, we're in the position uh, possibly to, to repave this church's parking lot on the east side. It's got chug holes in it. They're a faithful church. It's African-American church. They're a faithful church. They're baptizing. They're preaching the gospel. They don't have any money. Jim Evans stands up here at the Chili Cook-Off and says, you know, God's really blessed us, and I just get the feeling God's got a plan or a, a little task for us here. In the, next couple, uh, in the next couple months, the next morning, a man from that church is... That was not recorded, by the way, and put out on Facebook. He didn't see that. This man shows up. And he's, I said, well, why did you come here? He says, I just was let here. And we want you to know the problem we're facing. They didn't even say, can you help us pay for it? 
He said, we want you to know the problem we're facing. Well, why is our church in the position to be able to help? Because our church is filled with active Christians. And we give. We don't do capital campaigns. We don't, we don't do uh, themes. You want your vision? You want the vision for the church? Christ. That's the vision. It's not more campuses and bigger buildings. and It's Christ. Christ is the vision. And what does Christ produce? Now, back to Melchizedek. Was the priest, should be in, in Genesis 14, actually Jesus standing before Abram? Yes. Yes. I don't know. You ever heard me say that? <laughs> I don't know. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Because I would say yes, because he's the only person that has no beginning, no end, and no father, no mother, and lives forever. However, in Hebrews, the Word of God says, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God. Mine says resembling. 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 So my, my current belief is that this, that this is a premonition of Jesus um, in human form. I'm not willing to say that it is Jesus. Because Jesus had not yet become incarnate. But it's similar to the mystery of who were the three men that came to visit Abraham shortly thereafter before going to Sodom and Gomorrah. Are those the members of the Trinity? Was that Jesus and two angels? Because how many angels go down? The two angels. The point is it's a mystery. But the real point is, did this happen? Was there a man present named Melchizedek, and should we be considering how great he was? Now, my hope is that that's the goal for today, is that you'll consider how great this man was, because that's going to help us next week in comparing the order of Melchizedek to the order of Aaron or the Levites. As we close, I want you to look at uh, our last two notes here. So Melchizedek came from God. So where did he come from? No mother, no father. So all we can say is he's from God. Where did Abel come from? And Seth. And Noah. And Japheth. And they came from somebody, right? This guy, this man came from God. The Levites came from who? From Abraham. <laughs> if Abraham had never existed, there would be no Israel. Father Abraham. So Melchizedek, who came from God, is blessing Abraham through whom the Levites would come. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. The Levites received the Lord's blessing through Abraham. So the Levites were the receivers. Melchizedek was the... Melchizedek received... By the way, I had to copy-paste the name Melchizedek so I'd have to retype it every time. One of your homeworks is to memorize the spelling of his name. Melchizedek received a king's portion from Abraham. The Levites receive a tithe as a descendant of Abraham. And I wrote, boy, I got socks older than you. <laughs> when my son wants to talk back. <laughs> Melchizedek could say to any other priest, I got socks older than you. I've been around the whole time. And so, um, when we're thinking about the faith you have and the priest you have, it's important uh, to let the Bible guide your heart and mind into meditating on who this Jesus is. I remember one member in our church, uh, as he was growing in the faith, came to the conclusion that Jesus didn't start on Christmas. Because it's tempting to think you have Adam and Eve and all these, then the great heroes of the Old Testament, Noah and David and Jeremiah. And then finally, God sent us the real hero when none of those worked. 
Those were never, those never did work. They weren't designed to work. They were to, they were to magnify and prepare us for the giving of God's son, which was predetermined before eternity, before the world began, that in the fullness of time, God would give his seed through the woman, Genesis 3.15. The whole Old Testament is pointing, getting us ready of human failure, God's grace to the moment that Jesus Christ would come. Jesus, Melchizedek reminds us that the Jesus we have, the priest we have, predates all of these other things. To be a Christian is to participate in the most ancient of religions. Historically, we came into play in the year 33 at the resurrection of our Lord Jesus and on Pentecost. That's when it was activated for Gentiles. But the religion began at the beginning. So next week, we're going to get into the details of the priesthood. Today is to acknowledge this priesthood, which existed well before the Jewish priests. Jesus did not come after Abraham, Moses, or David. He is Yahweh saves. That's his name. He's Yahweh saves. I have been, uh, I have always been, I am, and I will be. Or as Hebrews likes to say, Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. The priesthood order for Jesus is the Melchizedek, not Levitical. Don't go back. Don't go back. You have Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the details of Scripture, the spade work we get to do, uh, the, the stories that, that sometimes are mis, uh, not seen, not meditated on, or even misinterpreted. But you preserve these stories, and then you, you sent out a, a writer, an apostle, to send this letter to the Hebrews to bring to life, to, to air out the story from Genesis 14. We pray, Father, for their, the early readers and for their eternal souls. We pray for the Gentile readers today that we would be shaped and moved by these words, that we would remember how great was Melchizedek and how great is your son, Jesus Christ, who is our priest forever and ever. In his holy name we pray. Amen.